Tom Johnson and Jim Nolan, thanks for joining us on the Illinois Channel. Thank Good to be you, here. You uh, wrote a book called Fixing Illinois, Politics and Policy in the Prairie State, and uh, I think anyone who's paid even casual attention know that Illinois has any number of problems facing it. I want to get into some of your reforms discussed, but let's just first, because people don't necessarily know who you are. Uh, Tom, let's start with you. Uh, just give us a little bit of a background of what you bring to the table as far as reformers? Well, uh, you know, I've got a, about a 40-year participation in government, either inside government or observing government. Uh, I was director of revenue for the state of Illinois in the early 80s, and most recently I was president of the Taxpayers Federation of Illinois um, and advocating for good fiscal policies in the state and tax policies. Uh, so I've been an observer for over 40 years of what's been going on in our state. Like Tom, I've been bouncing around Illinois government and politics for four decades or so. I worked for three unindicted <laughs> Illinois governors and was a state legislator and... Uh, Those are hard to find, by the way, unindicted governors. <laughs> the director of a couple of state agencies and uh, have uh, been involved in Illinois government and politics for many years now. Yeah, and more recently, I know with the... Uh, IGPA uh, at the University right. of Illinois. Senior yeah. fellow at the University of Illinois Institute of Government and Politics, author of a book on Illinois politics. So long story short, you guys have been around the block and you, you've seen, uh, so to speak, you've not just been riding in the car, you've lifted the hood and uh, both before now as well as for the purposes of this book that you've uh, delved into. Uh, so fixing Illinois, we're not going to be able to get into every single reform, but if you had to cherry pick and say, here's some of the things that would be a doable politically and would give us the biggest bang for the buck, what would some of those reforms be? Well, I think we have to uh, improve the business climate. Uh, we need to fix the fiscal situation and we need to increase trust in government. I think those are three underlying fundamentals that need to be addressed. Yeah, you know, I think that's important. That recently, the Gallup polls came out and did a, a polling of the 50 states. Uh, one of the asked questions that was asked is uh, your level of trust in your government, and Illinois ranked um, uh, dead last in that regard. And then a follow-up Gallup question was, if you had um, a choice, would you stay in your state or would you leave? And Illinois ranked um, again last in that regard. So I think what that key polling indicator was uh, we've lost our faith in our government, uh, largely attributable to our inability to manage our fiscal affairs, but even more importantly, the level of, um, uh, of confidence in our government and, and underlying that, the corruption and ethics issue. And I believe that the most important thing that we need to do first in order to turn the ship of state around is to address our um, corruption issues and ethical lapses. And if we're able to do that, then the faith in government will be improved. And as a result, the people will have more trust in their government. And we continue to think about uh, these types of suggestions we make in the book, and Tom's come up with one since the book came out about eliminating uh, pensions for elected officials at the state and local level in Illinois as a way of taking mischief, temptation for mischief out of uh, consideration and uh, I think that would over time contribute to increasing trust in how our government operates. Also one of the motivations for writing the book was Jim and I were both raised here in the state of Illinois, born and raised uh, in the 50s and 60s. Those were the boom years for Illinois. Things were really moving. Um, we were the fifth richest state in the nation as measured by our average household income. Uh, we've fallen to about 17th at this point in time. So we, we were born and raised when things were going well. And, uh, you know, a comment was made the other day, you know, um, people would ask, where are you from? You were from Illinois. Uh, today, most of the stories that have been written about our state is about, have been about our failures. Uh, and. Uh, that's been going on for the last 10 or 15 years, and we need to change that uh, perspective of our state. And in the future, people saying, where are you from? Illinois. Now people say, where are you from? Well, I'm from Chicago or outside Chicago or something like that. But 
not as often are we talking about the pride of being an Illinois citizen. And that's one of the motivations for the book. This book is about hope and about ways, that, optimistic ways that we can improve uh, the perspective of our citizenry about our state. And uh, hopefully some of these ideas will be championed by those who are seeking political uh, leadership in our state in the future. You know, I just recently uh, I interviewed Governor Edgar and was asking what his, some of his thoughts. And we noted that when he left, he came in with a deficit, but when he left, there was a $1.5 billion surplus. Mm -hmm. And I asked, uh, you know, what would he have done differently now? And he, he said, if I, he was surprised at how the legislature just went about after all that struggle to get the state back to fiscal balance, how quickly they spent it. And he goes, if I had known that, I would have done, tried to have done something to lock that money up or put it toward the pensions or something so that it wouldn't have been frittered away. Yeah. Are, are there any reforms that, knowing what you know, that what would you do about keeping, you know, we're supposed to, by Constitution, have a balanced budget. Today's July the 1. It's the first day of the new fiscal year, and yet no one believes that we have a balanced budget. How do we get the legislature to follow the law to have a balanced budget? We make a number of suggestions in the chapter on budgeting, one of which is that right now we simply examine the so-called general funds of the Illinois state budget, which represent only about half of the total state spending, and the other half generally goes uninvestigated during each budget session. So by making some mechanical changes in the way we budget and in the way we investigate our budget, I think we could become uh, more uh, disciplined in our budgeting. And Jim, you had mentioned earlier about turning around the uh, uh, the business climate. What would you do to make the business climate better in Illinois? Well, first, uh, you need to reduce the corporate income tax rate back to at least where it was before the temporary tax increases were enacted several years ago. We also need to continue work on workers' compensation uh, and eliminate the uh, causation standard for the uh, for the situation in which people injured on the job uh, don't even have to be at work to be capable of uh, being uh, seen as... Uh, so the workers' comp, I mean, if someone out throws their back out golfing, they could claim workers' compensation. Right. Uh, I think there were several hundred guards down at the Menard State Prison who received workers' compensation for uh, carpal tunnel syndrome on the basis of twisting their hands moving the keys in and out of the locks. So there's plenty of work to be done yet on workers' compensation. Have you looked, when you uh, looked at uh, reforming Illinois, did you consider what other states are doing and, and looked at what works? Well, yes. Uh, part of the study was uh, to determine how is it being done in other states, especially in the area of re-engineering government. Uh, we talk about um, the fact that in many states they have fewer units of local government and as a result, they may have greater accountability of, of, of local government spending. I'm, obviously, we're a high property tax state. But that's driven primarily by local government spending and the 7,000 units of local government that are involved in that. So we were looking, for example, in Florida, I think in Indiana, wasn't it, Jim? Um, most school districts are countywide school districts, where we have all, close to 1,900 school districts in Illinois. Uh, Florida has 150 with a much larger population than Illinois. Florida has 150. 150 of them. And each one of those school districts is going to have a superintendent and all of the... We have 377 dual districts in which underlying grade school districts, multiple grade school districts feed into one high school district. We recommend eliminating the dual districts and thus eliminating 377 school districts and making a more rational school district uh, organization plan. I want to go back more over, but I want to give people first the big picture before we get lost too much just right. in the details. If we were to enact the, de the reforms that you mentioned, how, how would Illinois be different? Well, first of all, there's 98 proposals in this book. Um, we would invite the general public and anybody that wants to help us in fixing Illinois, identify another 98 proposals as to ways we can make improvements. 
Uh, one of the things, uh, again, going back to the motivation of writing the book is the fact that uh, what's been written about our state, both within our state and nationally, has not been very complimentary in the last several years. We're going to be coming up on the 2008, in 2018, our 200th anniversary of our state. And one of the quests that Jim and I talk about is we want to be celebrating something other than fireworks that day. Some of our successes rather than the focus on our failures. And um, my temperament as to what it would, what are those successes? If, if we could get two stories in national publications, what I call the wow stories, wow, what are they doing in El look at what they're doing in Illinois, rather than the current state of affairs, which is, did you see what they're doing in Illinois? Um, we need to first admit that we need to fix our state. That's the first step. And then uh, identify champions for change to come up with some, use some of these base ideas as a building block to come up with other great ideas about uh, reforming our state. Now, Tom, a couple of years ago, I think it was Governor Quinn, when he first came governor, appointed you to take a look at where monies could be saved. From that experience, and the question is, you know, is you might have a great, a 98 great ideas, but to what extent are they going to be accepted by the political class? And from that experience, what did you, what do you draw from? Well, well, I think the whole titling of our book, if we all admit that we need to fix our state, fix Illinois, then that may be an umbrella of political protection, shall we say. The reason I'm proposing this dramatic change in the way we do business is because we need to do it in order to fix the reputation of our state. Any one of these proposals standing on their own could be, there's winners and losers, right. um, and could be criticized. But if it's done under the political protection of we need to do dramatic change in order to fix uh, our state, then maybe it'll be easier to accomplish some of these things. Um, Standalone proposals are often either voted up or down uh, based on the uh, political interests of those people that are affected by that proposal. Uh, we'd like to look at Illinois as this whole effort is something to, with the end result being, boy, Illinois turned itself around in the last four years. And there are important groups out there that could take up the issue of fixing Illinois. For example, Governor Jim Edgar has created a, an exciting new program called the Edgar Fellows, and each year he brings 40 of the best and brightest of those destined for success in public service to the University of Illinois for a week of intensive leadership training. And these Edgar Fellows stay together and communicate with one another subsequently. And we're going to challenge the Edgar Fellows when we speak with them to come up with the Edgar Fellows Bicentennial Plan for Illinois. You know our Bicentennial is just in a few years, in 2018. And these Edgar Fellows who are young legislators and mayors are the types who are concerned about our state and who could implement any plan or set of provisos they would come up with for improving the state of Illinois. So there, there are mechanisms out there for, for making change. Everyone knows who follows politics that there are what we call special interests. So that when you want to change, let's say the workers' comp, the, uh, there are going to be various groups who are going to say, no, don't do that, uh, whether they're the trial lawyers or the unions or whomever. Um, and too often, I think the people going back to the idea of corruption, I guess there's hard corruption, as we saw in Governor Blagojevich, and maybe a soft corruption of the extent to which um, there's the impression, I don't want to say, I think most people in the legislature are good and honest people, but when you want to be reelected, you're going to not want to bite the hand that gives you the campaign contribution. So it's very difficult to affect these changes when they're the people out there donating. How do we break w that political grip of money on, on change because there's going to be so many people in the legislature that even if they privately said, yeah, I know we got to do this to be more competitive with other states, are not going to do it because then they may as well just quit being a legislator. We have to rise above that if we're going to fix Illinois, and I think the public is, is desperate for positive change in the state of Illinois, and so as Tom says, maybe books like this give legislators some, some backbone and the willingness to make difficult decisions. Do you, 
what about term limits, which is perhaps going, we don't know yet if it's going to be on the fall ballot or not, uh, but if, what do you think, did you look at term limits and what would you think, because, you know, the idea being that lawmakers are going to be turned out anyway, that they won't be making deals that are good for them but not good for the general population. We spoke to the suggestion that there should be redistricting reform, which is problematic at the moment because of the recent court decision. But And we looked at term limits, but we didn't uh, make a suggestion in that regard. Uh, you know, Judge Mary Mikva uh, kind of said that's unconstitutional, and I guess that'll be uh, appealed, and so it may or may not be on the ballot. But that's what Governor Edgar, by the way, is also saying, that he's not for term limits but for uh, a fair map, I guess, of the redistricting reforms. The, the whole idea b between the independent uh, redistricting commission and why we support it as a proposal in our book is because what we need is a competition of ideas of what is the problem and how do, does each candidate for public office proposes to address that problem. When you have non-competitive legislative districts or non-competitive any elected position um, throughout the state, you don't get that natural competition of ideas that occurs within an election cycle. Uh, and that's what we support it, is to get ideas out there. So that the public can choose. Who do they support? The person with this idea or the person with that idea? And they have to sell their ideas as something that is not only the idea itself, but the goal is to significantly improve the world and the country's perspective of our state. Uh, we were the land of Lincoln. It was something we were very proud of. We put it on our license plate and so forth. Uh, we're not as proud as we used to be. That's what the Gallup polls tell us. And we need... Oh, and a lot of people are just moving out of the state. Well, uh, some are moving out of the state for various reasons and so forth. But the ones that remain, we want them to be proud of our state. We want to be proud of our state. And uh, we need to uh, ask our political leadership, those who are wanting to be elected to office, to say, I'm elected to change Illinois' reputation. Uh, and uh, some of these ideas are certainly controversial, but the purpose of why I'm proposing these changes is to have a significant impact on the way the world sees who we are. I think we also need to build upon the fact that we have great strengths in Illinois. Our infrastructure is probably the best in the United States in terms of uh, our interstate arteries, in terms of our railroad transportation and air transportation. We have lots to build upon in this state. We also have uh, great water resources, which we need to evaluate and think about for the future. This is a book about looking ahead rather than looking at next year, and the water resources are uh, something that we should evaluate closely to see what role they will play in a future in which much of the rest of the country is starving for water. So here's what I would say. I mean, uh, if you look at Illinois, you have the third largest, you have Chicago, which is a great city of the world. Yeah, right. I think everyone would agree with that. Right. You have all along the western border of Illinois, the largest river in America. Mm -hmm. You have some of the richest farmland. You're smack dab in the middle of the country, which is why Boeing moved here, so that they weren't out there in the corner in Seattle. So you do have a lot of good things going for And the rail system as well. The rail system is good. Um, you have the Ohio River along our southern border, which is maybe the second largest river in, in America. S on the other hand, and, and we export uh, billions of dollars, not just Illinois, but as a nation out of the Midwest, billions of dollars of grain right. to foreign markets. Right. They go down the Mississippi out through the port of New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And yet for the politicians, whether in Washington or here, in this case, I think Washington, we can't get the federal government to fund somewhere along the lines of, I'll pick a number, in the neighborhood of $20 billion, which out of a $3 trillion federal budget is nothing. Right. And we can't get them to put $20 billion into rebuilding the locks and dams on the Mississippi, of which we make billions of dollars in trade. So what's wrong with the political class that any man running a business would reinvest in the equipment that's making him money, but we as a society don't. That, that's one of the things. We don't have a, a long-term plan.
planning process in the state about what are going to be our challenges and how are we going to face those challenges. Um, our whole approach to uh, governance and management is what do we need to get through to the next year. Uh, that's what we've been doing, lurching from one year to the next year to determine how do we get through a budget rather than looking at what those challenges are down the road and investing so that those challenges are met. Um, and I think if we had a significant planning function of state government that said, look at 20 years down the road and how are we going to address this problem, greater confidence uh, on the part of the business community. For example, the business community today looks at Illinois and says it's got $100 billion worth of pension debt. It's got $6 billion worth of unpaid bills. It seems to not be able to put a fiscal plan together from one year to the next that is balanced as to resources and to expenditures, cutting uh, expenditures and, and living within the resources available. If a state can you know, how do we evaluate making an investment and in job creation in that state when it appears the state doesn't, isn't able to address its long-term needs and lurches from one year to the next. And we don't have necessarily the confidence that that state can manage its affairs effectively. I so think, you know. so the choice is, do we put that investment in our state or do we put that investment in another state in the Midwest? You know, this is a small country these days. And you have choices. And we have to make a good argument that the choices should be made here. And we're suggesting that some of these significant proposals need to be put into play so that uh, the people in the world and in this country can see that Illinois is turning itself around. You know, it seems to me that time is running out for the state. I mean, in that, as you say, there's a hundred billion dollar pension debt. We just, so far, well, I mean, well, unless they do something in the fall veto session, we're not going to extend the temporary tax increase, which did allow at least the past due bills to be paid down from somewhere in the neighborhood of $8 billion to about $4 billion. Yeah. If we can't pay down $8 billion, right. how are we going to pay $100 billion? Well, and I, I just don't, you know, I mean, isn't the state effectively already bankrupt? And if the political class doesn't get it yet, when will they? You know, it, it, it would appear that way. And certainly I think the public's perception is that. But it may not be that. Uh, $100 billion of debt paid off over 30 years represents what payment requirement as to what percentage of our own a annual spending. You know, we spend about $65 billion right, Jim, right. a year. And um, if we have to pay into the pension for- Let, let me repeat that if I might. So the, the population, I mean, the viewers get it. The total combined budget, we have operating budget and then special funds budget, the total expenditures of the operating state- budgets. Or, or about $65 billion. Yes, I mean, that's... Yes, right. So, of our own source, own source revenues out of that 65, make up probably 35 to 40 billion of it. And if pensions require a payment of about four or five billion, that represents about 10, 12% of our total revenue stream. It's a lot. And it crowds out spending for other resources, which is a, where a state needs to be able to compete as well. We need... But it, if it's shown as manageable and that this is how we're going to manage that annual cost, then I think confidence can be regained. But when it just sits out there as a large number and we only see how it's going to be managed or a portion of it's going to be managed this next year, mm -hmm. that's where the confidence in our ability to manage our fiscal affairs is eroded. In the section on the budget, we have a significant discussion of how Tom and I feel uh, that the approach to revenue should be low rates and broad base. We have a revenue system right now that's very narrowly based in sales taxes and even in the income tax. We could reduce rates and broaden the base and still generate the, the revenues we need. Uh, it would be difficult to do, but it makes, it makes good sense. So that, in other words, I mean, the thing is we're, we have somewhat of a tax system, you might say, that's based on the 1950s when we're widget makers sure. right. and uh, we're, not, uh, we're not taxing services. So if you buy, uh, if you, if you buy um, a widget, you know, a, a, something that's manufactured like a car, you're right. going to be paying a tax on it, but when you get a haircut or any number of other things, well, you don't... it's not only broad-based on sales tax, but income tax as well. If, if the goal... <clears throat> 
<coughs> low rates, broad basis, I mean, I mean we would approach um, the review of our tax system much differently. Um, when you have narrow bases and high rates, you really do create economic distortion because some people buy a lot in that high tax rate based um, area. For example, um, taxation of goods and the sales tax is consumed more, a greater percentage of your consumption from individuals is, is um, poor individuals is on goods rather than services. And the other aspect of it is broader bases are more reflective of the economy. And as the economy grows, the tax revenues grow. Narrow bases tend to be more cyclical as to their ability to produce revenue for this. Which means we're going to have to apply taxes to a whole host of services that are, that are not now being taxed, which means that you're going to have the, the barbers of Illinois complaining, you're going to have, you know, whatever, the Certainly. bowling leagues of Illinois complaining. But at, at what point is the problem not with our political class, which, the, you know, the citizens, but to say, turn it around and say up to a mere, it's you, the citizens, it's you, the citizens that reelected Rod Blagojevich, it's you, the citizens that don't want to be taxed, but you want goods and services provided to you. Well, I think the uh, Southern Illinois University, the Simon Institute, does the surveys regularly of um, what, pro you know, where do you want to cut state spending? In the general areas, you can't cut state spending anyplace. Uh, is the general results of those polls. Uh, should you uh, retain the current tax structure or increase rates? No, you shouldn't do that either. So we do have to look ourselves in the mirror and say, what do we expect from our government? Well, I think we need to, what we expect from our government leaders is a clear statement of what we need to do to regain uh, our faith in ourselves. And uh, that's a little difficult to do because uh, some of the things are not always politically popular. But if we educate the people that this is what we need to do to turn our state around, I think the general public will support it. And going back to what, let me just compare running a state to running a business, which I've done. You have current consumption. Mm -hmm. In a business, it would be payroll. But on the other hand, you want, if you're, I had a printing business, you have to save something and put it into new equipment because you have to stay current. Would it be so, in essence, I'm trying to just keep this simple on one hand, but as a state, if we said, we're going to put so much money into tomorrow, right. into rebuilding our universities, our highways, or whatever, mm -hmm. and on the other hand, it seems like so much of what we spend money on today is we don't get a return on that investment. Uh, we're, we're, we're paying so much more for pensions, but you don't get a return on investment on pensions. I yeah. mean, that's that's just a cost structure and, and it's, it's robbing us of our tomorrow by our spending today. And one more thing, and I, not to be out of toil. Yeah, it's, you know, I, I some, in, in any event, uh, but I'm, what do we do about, and maybe this is what you're saying, lurching from one year to the next. Two years ago or so, we passed the SMART Act, which was supposed to save about a billion and a half out of our Medicaid spending. Mm -hmm which was a bipartisan effort with great right. amount of work going into that. Mm -hmm. And now the governor wants to expand Medicaid mm -hmm. two years later. Well, I think this is why we need to do longer term thinking and we can uh, in Illinois, but we haven't. Uh, there's a great deal of long term thinking going on in the metropolitan Chicago area related to local government issues and it kind of crowds out or overshadows the interest in focusing on the state of Illinois, which has different functions and responsibilities than do the local governments. And if we can look ahead 10 or more years to what the needs are in terms of investment in infrastructure, for example, maybe we can help the public understand the needs and how to address them, whether it's by revising the revenue system or uh, taking other actions. Well, one of the other examples in the books and proposals is investment in technology. You know, if you look at the private sector, worker productivity improvements over the last 20 years is directly related to the investment in, by companies in technology support to make the, their workers more productive. Uh, we've not done as good a job in state government. Uh, the technology expenditures uh, tend to be taken out of the operating budget or proposed as part of the operating budget rather than considered a long-term capital investment. Private sector considers technology investment 
not the laptops and so forth, but the large technology investment as long-term investments to improve the profitability of the company and to improve the productivity of its workers. We need to approach it the same way. We consider building a road a capital investment. Why don't we consider investment in technology and capital investment? Hey, let me, if very, very recently, Governor Quinn has proposed doing just that, and we commend him for it. Right. Which would be good, because I was going to say, uh, Julie Hamos who had testified uh, as head of DCFS or whatever. Uh, HFS. 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 Uh, a couple of years ago, she was saying that the computers they were using were 30 right. years old. What business would run? Right. And she has a multi-billion dollar agency or department. That right. what, what business would do that? I interviewed someone else that was saying, who studied uh, fraud. Right. And they were saying, what, what do you think a, a thief would want out of your wallet? And most people would say, your credit card. And she goes, no, it's your health care card because you probably only have ten to twelve thousand dollar credit line on your credit card but I can bill up to a million dollars on your health care if I'm charging Medicaid right. and we don't have the technology to find out that the person we're spending Medicaid on died twelve years ago <laughs> you know because we haven't updated right. our computers we have no idea how much fraud there no. is in the system and, and as you know there's a lot of different um, human services and health care programs around by the state and different agencies of state government. Uh, they're all directed to delivering services to individuals, or the individual is the beneficiary of the service. The difficulty is without good technology, you don't know whether or not 12 different programs are providing services to an individual, or whether, because they don't communicate with each other. Is there any, and your point on fraud, you would see signals in a system that you had uh, a significant technology program to support uh, running that program. They do it in the private sector. Uh, we have to do it in the government sector. Well, I often find when we go, uh, you know, Newt Gingrich would bring this up, but we go and get gas and we have to pop in our, our zip code so to cut down on fraud. I mean, right. if the private sector can do this, it's as if we have a technological moat around state government that says, you, the private sector, go out and improve things and invest in technology, but not us. Well, each because we funded technology improvements out of operating budgets, every operating budget would propose solving their problem, not coordinating all of the systems to solve the state's problems. That's what we're suggesting has to be done, and it needs to be part of this long-term plan. Let's put the investment in today and measure its successes. Is there, have you talked to any people in government as you did your research? And of course you, oh, yeah. I mean, at, is there finally, maybe, maybe we're at the point because we're getting desperate that people who never would have been for change would be willing to seek change now. But there's so many little fiefdoms built up around here, whether it's a technological fiefdom or a political, you know, a school district or whatever. But I think that's one of the themes here, that we need to kind of break down the walls and say we need to take a holistic view of what we're doing, right? I mean, yeah. well, is, is there a, can you get the cooperation of the politicians and the political class, whether elected officials as well as the non-elected officials, to go along with something like this? I think we have to, and I think it depends upon the public being desperate enough and concerned enough about its state to demand that that be done. and that. I think politicians will respond if, if the public uh, expresses outrage in the situation to which we've come. Uh, time's growing short, and yeah. I know we have to wrap up here, but uh, give us your summation, I guess. So what would you want people to, uh, to, either the politicians or the viewers, to kind of walk away from this, and, 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 lay, and we'll end there? We want to celebrate our 200th anniversary in 2018 talking about the successes that we've made in the recent past four years. And as a result of that, the world, the state, country will be celebrating our successes as well. You know, it's partly our perception of who we are and where we're going. And hopefully this book will help uh, those who are seeking political leadership offices to say, we have got to make these dramatic changes because we need to improve the world's perspective of who we are. Uh, we deserve it. We were once the fifth wealthiest state in the nation. 
Uh, we want to, we may not get back to that point because the measurement is different today than it was back in the 50s and 60s, but that's our goal. And in order to achieve that goal, we can't make, we, we, we can't uh, work around the edges of, of the programs of government. We have to make dramatic change. And what we're hoping we'll get out of this process is champions for change to fix Illinois. Um, and we should demand that our public officials or those who are seeking public uh, life uh, lead us. But can I insert, uh, Joe, I'm going to hear you, but is that champions for change? Is that a slogan or is that something you're actually proposing like as a commission? Two so slogans, fixing Illinois and what we need to do is identify champions for change. Maybe these Edgar fellows that Jim right, talked about right. before. I mean, I could see if people who are leaders in their community, they don't want to necessarily run for office, but they might not mind volunteering to be part of some of a larger effort that was coordinated. Absolutely. I'm sorry, Jim. No, I'm just saying we also see this as the beginning of a conversation. We don't uh, believe we have all the answers. There are a lot of bright people out there who believe in Illinois and who have good thoughts, and we want those contributions as well, and we provide uh, contact information in our book. Uh, to keep the conversation going. All right, well, gentlemen, we, we know time's short. The, the, the sirens are going off. I guess right. that tells us we have to leave, but we thank you both for joining us. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks a lot. You're watching the Illinois Channel, an independent nonprofit corporation formed to provide gavel to gavel coverage of Illinois state government and other public affairs events taking place across Illinois.